You've tuned into The Break Room, a weekly conversation about how the city of St. Augustine works from those who do the work every day. Hosted by the city of St. Augustine's communications manager, Melissa Whistle, The Break Room offers a closer look at the city's programs and provides updates on current and upcoming projects. And now your host for The Break Room, Melissa Whistle. Welcome to The Break Room. Thanks for stopping by. I'm Melissa Whistle, Communications Manager for the City of St. Augustine. As is the tradition at the start of hurricane season, I have invited St. Augustine Fire Chief Carlos Avalis back to The Break Room for our annual conversation about, well, hurricane season. Thanks for coming back. Thanks for having me. It is that time of year again. It is. And as Fire Chief, of course, you are charged with the operations of our fire department, but you also have responsibilities that extend to that of being the city's emergency manager. What does that mean? So, uh, yeah, so I wear multiple hats during this time Mm -hmm. of year, Mm -hmm. and I serve as the city's emergency management coordinator. And so I end up being the go-between or the official liaison between the city of St. Augustine uh, and the St. John's County Emergency Operations Center. Okay. You're the emergency go-to guy for the city. Sure. And city manager still... Serves as city manager. 100%. No. Are there any type of executive order type things like we saw during COVID where the commission sort of authorizes the city manager to make decisions similar to that? Yes. So there are okay. there are times where the city manager could execute certain orders if, okay. if that was deemed appropriate. Um, more often than not, we're in lockstep with St. John's County and are following, you know, all of their leads and mm-hmm. as far as what we're doing. So the... City manager remains uh, atop the the hierarchy for right. the city, mm-hmm. and so uh, Mr. Regan serves as sort of the uh, chief executive officer, okay. and then I sort of become elevated as the chief operations officer. So John handles most administrative, and then I handle operations for the city during um, these emergencies. Correct. Yeah. Preparedness, re- response, and recovery. Excellent. And looking back, our first hurricane recently was Matthew. You and I kind of cut our teeth together. Yep. Uh, <laughs> during that, you were you were newly the fire chief. I had just joined the city in my role uh, as communications public information coordinator. Uh, I think I had been with the city eight or nine months in my job, and you had been a firefighter for many years, but not chief. No, no, I think I had, I uh, can't remember, three or four weeks right. uh, as chief. So, no, it wasn't a whole lot of time. Right. But we've gotten real good at this thing called emergency response, Mm -hmm. both as a municipality, but also the community has weathered many storms. Um, And we've been relatively, I would say, successful by by all measure Mm -hmm. when we see these types of emergencies. And we, you know, we went a really long time without having to implement a lot of these plans. And so uh, I think Matthew was a very severe wake up call to folks. I mean, unfortunately, it's ended up being... um, the beginning of a horrific normal for us. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, I hate that for this community, right. um, but in turn, I mean, we've gathered a lot of experience. We know what works, we know what to expect. Mm-hmm. And that really has helped us in our uh, planning efforts. And when you and I talk a lot, we're talking about information strategies. You and I spend a lot of time together during the emergencies of, in addition with emergency management at the county level, but those three key elements that we really try to focus is preparedness, response, and recovery. And there's preparedness, not just for the residents, but also for the city. So there are different things that residents should keep in mind, which seem obvious, but maybe now's a good time to remind folks that preparedness um, as a resident, as well as the things that the city is doing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we take this time of year um, really to do citywide preparedness drills. Uh, updating contact information. We'll do high-level training with every department in the city to review policies, procedures, and just make sure that everything, um, that everyone knows what is expected of them, what their roles and responsibilities would be. And, you know, so this year, Mm -hmm. um, the only thing that's slightly different is we have seen a lot of supply chains uh, not be able to fulfill the way that they normally would. Okay. And so we're looking at inventory of equipment, things that we may need that we do not currently have on hand, and what is the accessibility of that equipment? Should we need it? Do we need to start ordering some of the needed supplies ahead of time just to have them? Right. Um, and it goes for the residents. It's things like the usual batteries, food, 
um, sandbags, knowing your evacuation zone, knowing the route if you need to evacuate. Um, an evacuation, a good reminder to folks, doesn't necessarily mean you got to get all the way up to Georgia. Right. Right. It, <laughs> yep. Can, so, I mean, when, when we order these evacuations, it's it's primarily driven by, by water. Mm-hmm. It, it's rising water that is the, the key concern. And uh, so, now, I mean, oftentimes just moving a couple of miles inland will, will, mm-hmm. will, is more than sufficient. That's good to remember, too, is it's really about the water rising mm-hmm. and being safe. Um, so we have our preparedness. So once we're we're getting our head around being prepared, being ready, we've got our sandbags, we've got our paperwork in order, insurance is up to date, and we kind of sit and wait for this response of what comes at us. Mm-hmm. We're, we're watching. Everybody watches the the eye of the storm, and we get into knowing what to do when it comes time to actually take action. Correct. I mean, so again, the response for us is is vastly different than what it would be for most people. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think. Uh, for the average resident, the response phase is probably their least favorite because that is their uh, moment of most anxiety. Mm-hmm. They're just sitting around waiting to know that this is over. I mean, we're very active during uh, that time, either in some sort of a massive search and rescue effort or to rapidly clear as much of the city as we can in preparation for reopen as, as quickly as possible. And that's one thing um, we have put the most emphasis on over the last few years is streamlining that process to allow residents back into the city as quickly as possible and and as safely as possible. So hold that thought. Let's come right back to it. Um, You are listening to The Break Room. I'm Melissa Whistle, Communications Manager for the City of St. Augustine. Thank you for tuning in. This week in studio, we are talking about hurricane season, preparedness, response. And now let's talk a little bit about recovery with St. Augustine Fire Chief and Emergency Manager Carlos Avalis. So we've been talking recovery is, I mean, for the residents, like you started to mention, it was when do I get to come back if we've been evacuated? When is the electricity going to come back on? Trees are down. I got to get with my insurance. That's that's a lot of stress. Yeah, so that's oftentimes the longest phase. Mm-hmm. Preparation goes fairly quickly. Response doesn't last quite as long. Recovery ends up being the longest phase. And so that's everything from debris management and clearing roadways, getting debris out of people's homes and, and off of the streets, uh, and then really you know, putting the pieces of their lives back together. So it does take a significant amount of time. For the city, um, I think sometimes people might think, well, once the roads are cleared, and power's back on, City Hall is back open, more or less things seem on the surface to be back to normal, businesses are open, but there's a lot of, you got FEMA funding, reimbursements, um, financial uh, implications. Yep. We still are seeing activity in terms of um, the recovery, if you will, are we still seeing some of that even from Matthew? Absolutely. I know Irma. Yeah. No, I mean, we've seen, uh, we still see a lot of it. So it's funny because you, you're you you're 100% accurate, right? Like those uh, maybe 48 hours after the storm, things slowly seem to get back mm-hmm. to normal. Uh, so it's sort of that duck on water analogy mm-hmm. that from the surface, everything looks really calm, but behind right. the scenes, we're just <laughs> frantically kicking right. and trying to keep up um, infrastructure wise. Um, something as simple as making sure that your toilet's flush takes right. a tremendous amount of work. Uh, during Matthew and also during Irma, we lost a significant number of our lift stations and pump mm-hmm. stations all over the city. And We've talked many, about that. Yeah, mm-hmm. and many of those were run off of generators and portable pumps, which had to be maintained constantly to keep the system working mm-hmm. so that there wouldn't be backups. And it, that's a 24-hour, around-the-clock operation that I don't think most people realize right. happens. <laughs> uh, so that's one of those, you know, behind the scenes, there's a very dedicated, fantastic group of people mm-hmm. that work to ensure that we can try to return to a sense of normalcy, even if it's not normal at all. One of the things I learned after Matthew was that public works becomes a first responder. Absolutely. I, yep. I, in my, first responders to most people are fire and police mm-hmm. and emergency management. But the public works department, like you just said, sanitation, sewer, clean water, dirty water out, clean water in. That, that's a lot. And you're right, our infrastructure, and we've talked about it with some of our engineers and our public works folks who have come on the break room, that uh, those lift stations, there's infrastructure that is, not only is it old, now you add in the damage. Correct. It becomes more than just replacing something item for item. It becomes a whole system replacement. 
Yeah. It's huge. I mean, so yeah, they don't get enough credit. I mean, the role that Public Works uh, has every day, but especially in the short term disaster, so um, or in the short term after a disaster, mm-hmm. so they're handling the bulk of your um, debris management. Right. So getting everything cleaned up, making sure that you have uh, clean water, making sure the dirty water goes where it mm-hmm. needs to go and is right. contained. Not up uh, the, into correct. the <laughs> yeah. streets. And, and for us, uh, making sure that we have adequate fire suppression. That's mm-hmm. a massive part of what we do. And so, you know, we have to have that trust that when we hook up to a hydrant that the water's there for us. Right. You know, we had close to 17 or 18 fires after uh, Matthew. Matthew. Mm-hmm. And so just that, that knowing that that need is there is, is absolutely right. critical. So they do a great job, it, but it, you're hundred percent right. right. They become sort of that lead once you get into recovery. The uh, other one is the, the thought or image of everyone kind of on mass returning home and everybody turning on their electricity at the same time, Right. everybody flushing their toilets at the same time. Again, that was something that I never gave any thought to, and you even mentioned the fires. I don't. I didn't realize that that had happened till even after a couple weeks later, where you had said something to me like, "Well, you know, we had like eighteen fires." And I, what? Yeah, I mean, not all big, mind <laughs> right, you, right. but no, but it is that. I mean, it's so it's uh, utilities being flipped back on. You know, a lot of people stayed mm-hmm. um, during Matthew because they didn't think it was going to be that bad. I mean, we have you know those images of people wading through. Uh, waste mm-hmm. deep water down mm-hmm. King Street or Valencia Street. Um, so if you're in your home going through normal day-to-day tasks and all of a sudden the electricity shuts off, very few people, and the water starts to rise, very few people go back and think, well, I really should have shut off my breakers or I should have made sure that my gas stove was off. They're just <laughs> like, oh, everything's off. It's not going to be on for a while. I'm, I'm going to get out of here. Right. And so you had stoves that were left on when power was shut off, and all of a sudden somebody somewhere flips this big giant, you know, grid switch that that turns everything back on, or appliances that were plugged in are on, and now there's nobody home, and all those outlets were wet, but they're suddenly being re-energized, or pilot lights burnt out because water got in there, gas continues to run, and um, we had, I can't remember the exact number, but, but north of, you know, 20 underground propane tanks. Yeah, that unearthed themselves I, because they I became buoyant that. in the floodwaters. And yeah. I mean, so there's so many different hazards that we are are just rapidly trying to mitigate. Mm-hmm. So that because all we want is for people to get back in their homes. Sure, like we're doing everything that we can, and it's all hands on deck. No, yeah, nobody we wants want you back home more than you do. Than us, hundred percent. Yeah, right. and we understand that. You know, it's that that first step of recovery is is you stepping foot back in your home, and we want to do everything that we can to make that happen. And uh, while the storms are happening and such, we kind of hunker down at the Emergency Operations Center. Uh, We work, like you mentioned at the beginning, lockstep with the county. Um, As we saw some of the the decision matrixes that we had during COVID, we had to make different decisions. But as you mentioned, we very much, once we kind of get the city under, under control with what needs to happen in that downtown historic area, evacuations, because we're right along the coast, we are right in step with decisions countywide um, out of the EOC. Yep. Um, so we've run out of time. So let's hold that thought with uh, the city's relationship with the county. And if you've got some time to join me again next week, let's come back and continue the conversation about hurricane season. Uh, one of the things that we want to make sure we remind, we remind folks, and I say it every week, but it's more important today, that uh, getting connected and being connected with the city is where you want to get your information, especially during hurricane season. You want to get your information locally. Uh, we do have the hurricane preparedness guides that are available. You want to make a, a, a plug for the hurricane guide? Yeah, absolutely. So the 2000, or 2020 mm-hmm. uh, St. John's County Emergency Management Hurricane Preparedness Guides are out. Okay. Uh, it's all the information that you will need. Uh, they're available at all city buildings, fire department on Malaga Street, the St. Augustine Police Department at 151 King Street, Financial Services Center mm-hmm. at 50 Bridge, right. uh, 75 King Street for City Hall, and also the Marina at 111 Avenida Menendez. So if you don't have one, pick it up. The best time to plan are during blue skies. Absolutely. Chief, thank you for coming today. We'll get back on this discussion next week as well. Uh, Thank you for tuning in. If you missed part of this broadcast and you want to hear it back from the beginning, 
Uh, or if you'd like to hear any of our past interviews, check us out at com on the web. As we wrap up another edition, I hope we answered your questions. If not, take a minute and send an email to info at com. We want to keep you informed about what's happening in and around the city. Most importantly, that you hear it here from the people doing the work and making it happen every day, and especially during hurricane season. Remember that in order to stay connected, you need to be connected. Be sure to like us and follow us on any of our social media platforms. You'll find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at City St. Og. Thanks for tuning in. You've been listening to The Break Room, a weekly program about projects and programs offered by the City of St. Augustine. We hope you'll join us each week as host Melissa Whistle and her guests have a conversation that helps you better understand how our city works to meet the needs of our community. See you next time on The Break Room.